me, they saw the topic of uh, the shir today, and the topic is about machlokas, when machlokas is worth it. And they said, you know, that sounds like an interesting topic, but it does not really sound like a topic you're allowed to learn on Tisha uh, You know, the Chazal give us a very clear list of what you may and may not learn on Tisha B'Av. A person is allowed to learn Devarim Harayim, we're allowed to learn things that uh, relate to the Chorban, the Agarit Gemaras and Meseches Gitten for sure, the uh, stories of Eov, Sefer Eov itself, the Agadita about Eov in Meseches Babasra, the Nevuos of Yirmiyahu Hanavi, uh, Hilchos Avelus, there's no shortage of what we can learn on Tisha B'Av, but where, where in that is learning a Machlokas in Pirkei Avos, or not a Machlokas, a Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, relating to Machlokas, what does that have to do with Tisha B'Av? And the answer is, I think, if I'm correct, it could be that I'm just wrong and uh, this is one big Avera, but if I am correct that uh, that we are allowed to be learning what we're going to be learning this afternoon, it's based on the idea that uh, we part of the avoda of the day today is to try to find what we did wrong in terms of what caused Khurban, figure out how to fix it, and work on fixing it. Avelus is not meant to be just a time to be sad. It's meant as a time to contemplate. You know, Chazal tell us, Tov l'lechus l'beis avel mi beis mishta, that it's better to participate in a beis avel than it is in a beis mishta, because v'achai yitein alibo. Avelus in its own, and just standing independently, is not something that has great value to it. It's v'achai yitein alibo, that those who live, those who are still here, have to then focus on what is there to learn from this. There's always a lesson. There's always something that can be derived. And Chazal spent a lot of time and, and many, many passages throughout Shas that discuss why the Churban happened. And that's also an appropriate thing to learn. Most famously, of course, the Gemara Masechah's Yuma tells us that the first base of Middash was destroyed on account of Avodazara, Gili Arayus, and Shrikas Damim, and the second base of Middash was destroyed on account of Sinas Chinam. The Gemara Masechah's Nedarim tells us that the first base of Middash was destroyed based on the Pesukim, al-Azva mes Torasi, for an abandonment of Torah. We had recently, for those doing the Daf Yomi and Daf Kuf Yutasim Shabbos, an entire list of possible Averos for which the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. Why? Why do I need to know all these Averos? I know I'm supposed to do mitzvahs, I'm not supposed to do Averos. No, but if these are the causes of Chorban, then fixing them, rectifying the mistake, is the is the basis for Binyan. You know, the Beis HaLevi has a remarkable comment, where the Beis Salevi writes that a lot of times people think oh, we're paying the price for the Averos that were done back then, for the Averos that our forefathers did in the days of the Beis Amigdash, so now we're paying the price still because we haven't overcome what they have done. Beis Levi says, no, Chazal have a very different view, that the Chazal tell us, Gemara Nesachas Brachos, that called Dar, that any generation that the Beis Amigdash, I'm sorry, the Gemara in uh, the Yerushalmi, that any generation that the Beis Amigdash is not rebuilt in its days Ki'ilu, as Rav Asher Weiss often points out, the end of the line is Ki'ilu Hu Chorvo, that any generation that the base of Midrash is not rebuilt in our lifetimes, we are the ones who destroyed it. It's not just that it happened once because of Averos of previous generations. It happens anew in each and every generation. Every generation that does not have a Mikdash has destroyed the Mikdash. And therefore, we have those same Averos that are the cause for Khurban. That might even be the explanation as to why the Gemara gives such a wide range of Averos that cause Khurban, because maybe they're not all talking about those generations when it actually physically happened. Maybe Chazal are talking about each and every generation where it continues to happen, where Khurban continues to happen. But clearly, clearly, there is a tremendous emphasis on sinas chinam, in, 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 in assessing what needs to be fixed and what needs to be done in advance of a gu'ul shleima. And we've had different kinds of tisha b'avs throughout the years. Remember a few years ago when we had the summer with the three boys 
Hashem Yikom Dhamma, where we entered into a Tishbav, and I remember that feeling that we had that Klal Yisrael had actually come together, that uh, these three boys had such an impact, and I still believe to this day that even though Geula didn't happen that year, they brought us so many steps closer to Geula, because when Klal Yisrael comes together, we know that we're getting that much closer to Geula. This year, sometimes I have the gnawing feeling that we've taken maybe some steps further away, that with everything that's been happening and all of the very difficult challenges that the world is facing, Klal Yisrael hasn't really coalesced. We haven't really fully come together the way that we should, the way that we ought to come together, the way that the Rebona Shalom expects us to come together. And therefore, this is a day that we're supposed to assess how we handle disagreements, how we handle the fact that we are, by our nature, we're not always going to agree with each other, by human nature, but especially by our nature, by Klal Yisrael's nature. So we work on, we work on, but to be successful in those endeavors, to be successful in that work, we cannot possibly avoid all machlokas. That would be silly, that would be impossible. It's inevitable that disputes will happen. You know, it's like if you were to coach a a young man and woman who are getting married about uh, relationship advice, and they would say, oh no, no need, we're never going to get into an argument. Uh, it's possible, it's possible that you'll never get into an argument. It is highly unlikely that you're never going to get into an argument. They say, Rabbi Meir Goldwich Schlita once told me that Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach told him that when he was in his Yichud room on the day that he got married, Rav Shlomo Zalman get, did, couldn't afford a gift for his wife for the Yichud room. They were very, very poor. So he couldn't afford a gift for his wife for the Yichud room. So he decided that his gift to his wife in the Yichud room was that for every argument they have every disagreement they have for the first 10 years of the marriage, she's right. She automatically wins. That was his gift in the in the Yichud room. Rav Goldberg said, I suspect that on the 10-year anniversary, he gave her a lifetime contract on that. But we have to appreciate that that is a, that is a story of a Gadol Hadar. That's not a story of a normal human being. Yeah, Gadole, Gadole Hadar, you know, that's like telling a story that you want to inspire someone and say, Rav Yashiv would learn 21 hours a day. That's, it's great for Rav Yashiv that he learned 21 hours a day and it's very inspiring to hear that. That's not a normal expectation for us to have of ourselves. There are always going to be disputes in life. There are always going to be disagreements in life and we have to learn how to deal with them. We have to learn how to manage them. We have to learn how to navigate them and then we're going to be able to, uh, to accomplish that which is meant to be accomplished. You know, I deal, thank God, I'm very, so privileged to deal on, day, on a daily basis with the future rabbis of the world essentially, with uh, Smicha students in Yeshiva University. And in, no one, no one thinks, oh, one day I'm going to become a rabbi so I can be engaged in communal machlokas. There we're going to have lebedic machlokas about kashros and about the Yerub. And about, we're going to argue about everything. It's going to be fantastic. No one thinks that way. Everyone thinks, no, I'm never going to get, I'm just an easygoing guy. I just want to learn Torah. I just want to teach Torah. Machlokas is never going to happen. It's never going to come my way. Why would Machlokas ever happen? But it's a reality of life. It will happen. And we need to teach ourselves and train ourselves how to handle it properly. And you should know the opposite of Ahavas Yisrael is not Machlokas. It might be Sinas Chinam is the opposite of Ahavas Yisrael. I think probably even more so indifference is the opposite of Avas Yisrael. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. When there's a great passion that, 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 that is aroused in a person, that usually means that they're emotionally invested. Now, how that comes out, it might come out in the form of great love. It might come out in the form of something less noble than great love, but, but it means that the person's emotionally invested. When a person is totally indifferent, that's the opposite of Ava. When a person doesn't care, and we cannot deny the significant role of machlokas in our religion. If we just walk away from everything, that, that ultimately reflects a sense of not caring. Machlokas shaped Judaism and continues to shape Judaism, and it helps us achieve a real picture of Ratzon Hashem. We just have to make sure it's the right kind of machlokas and that we're handling it properly. You know, the Orchus Sadikim is my favorite Musr Sefer. It is written in a way 
that, that, that bases itself on one foundation, one yesod, that is the foundation for everything that the Orch HaSadikim writes. And that foundation is that there is no such thing as a good midah and no such thing as a bad midah. Every midah that one has can be used for the good and can be used for the bad. I was just learning the Chorben Agaritas with uh, members of my shul last night and some others as well. And w- one of the, the things that jumps out at the Chorben Agarita is how quickly the Gemara, the, how quick the Gemara is to highlight the Anivus of Zechariah ben Avkulis in destroying the Beis HaMikdash. That his Anivus caused the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Now, wh- why, why would that be the message? I mean, the message we're going to have about Chorben is don't be too humble, don't have too much anivus. I mean, it may be that he, he overdid the anivus. Fine, but that's going to be the message that we need to hear, that we have too much anivus. That is not the problem of our generation. We are not suffering from an overabundance of anivus. You know, you would think there would be some other message. And I thought, as I was reading the Gemara last night, is that no, maybe the point is not about anivus, but it's that you can take any mida, even the most noble of all midos, which is anivus. It is the most noble of all midos. And now we can demonstrate clearly because our greatest people have always excelled in that midah. Those who were Zoha to be to participate actively in the Masada Satora from Harsinai on down are always the people who excelled in the Midah of Anivus more than any other midah. And maybe the Gemara's point is even Anivus can be misused. Everything, every midah can be misused. It can be used properly and it can be used improperly. Machlokas fundamentally sounds like a negative thing. It sounds bad, but it's not all bad. Everything is a tool that can be used for the good and it can be used for the bad. Sometimes machlokas is the only way to make shalom. Sometimes issues need to be aired out. Things need to be discussed. Shalom bias, there's nothing worse than being passive aggressive or than just being non-caring, than being uh, totally uh, removed from, from a situation. Sometimes having that discussion, having that healthy debate brings about shalom bias, brings about shalom in a community. Shammai and Hillel only maintained three disputes. The Gemara Nida tells us. Shammai and Hillel themselves, the Talmidim, were, uh, were, had many, many more, but Shammai and Hillel only had three disputes. That means that they were able to communicate well enough to resolve almost every issue that they had. That through their communication with each other, they resolved everything. They were left with only three disputes. Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis, who we just discussed, had this anivus, his over-willingness to compromise and to just say, whatever everybody else says is fine, that's what led to the Chorben Abayis, his unwillingness to stand up for what is right and what needed to be done. When they said, okay, what do we do with this animal? Do we bring it as a carbon, even though a Balmum is not supposed to be brought as a carbon? And he, he refused to pass in that halacha, even though it's clear what the halacha is. When they said, can we kill Bar Kamtsa? because he's a rodef, and you refuse to pass in that halacha, even though it's clear what the halacha is, that's what led to the Chorban. That's reflected in the Kamsa of Bar Kamsa story. It's also reflected in the Dafyomi we did not so long ago. The Gemara quotes a Tosefta from just a couple of days ago. There's a machlokas in the, in the Mishnah about how to discard date seeds. If you eat a date and you have extra seeds from the date, you don't eat the seeds. So what do you do? How do you discard them? Are they muktza? So there's a discussion in the Mishnah that we're probably not allowed to learn on Tishbab about how to discard them properly, whether it's muktza to remove them by hand, or you just shake them off the table or something like that. And what does Zechariah ben Avkulis do? I can't pass in that machlokas. He would spit them behind the couch so that they wouldn't be visible over the course of Shabbos, then presumably after Shabbos, he would go and clean them up. Why wouldn't he, why wouldn't he just pass in one way or the other? The Tosefta that the Gemara quotes, the Gemara doesn't quote this part of the Tosefta, but my friend Rabbi Yechazkel Freundlich pointed out that the Tosefta that the Gemara is quoting actually concludes that line by saying, An vasnusa Rabbi Zuchari ben Avkulas, the Anivus Rabbi Zuchari ben Avkulas, Hechrugis Beiseinu, Saraf Asechaleinu, destroyed our base of Mikdash, burnt our Hechel. Even in that context, it was, it was a character flaw that he refused to take a stand, that he refused to paskin when a, a psak was needed, that he refused to stand up for what was right. And that flaw, ultimately, it, it started with date seeds, but ultimately it came out again in the Kamsa and Bar Kamsa story, and it, and it ultimately destroyed the Beis Amidus. Let's discuss a little bit about 
proper machlokas. There is a Mishnah in the fifth parak of Avos, Parakei Mishnah Yitzayim. Machlokas, the Mishnah highlights what is machlokas l'shem shemayim and machlokas shalol l'shem shemayim. The Mishnah gives us paradigms of the good kind of machlokas and the bad, bad kind of machlokas. Kol machlokas shi l'shem shemayim sofa l'hiskayim. Any machlokas that's l'shem shemayim is going to stand. V'sha'in l'shem shemayim ain't sofa l'hiskayim. If it's not l'shem shemayim, it will not stand. What is a paradigmatic example of a machlokas that is l'shem shemayim? Zu machlokas hilol v'shamay. That's the machlokas hilol and shamay. V'she'ena l'shem shemayim? Zu machlokas korach v'kol adaso. And a machlokas shalol l'shem shemayim is a machlokas korach v'adaso. So if we really want to understand how to argue. You know, we want to understand how to, how to handle a machlokas properly. We need to look at the characteristics of the machlokas between Shema, Shammai, and Hillel, see what they did, see what the Rishonim have to say about their machlokas, and then figure out how to apply that to our lives and to our to our disputes, whether they be disputes within our families, disputes with our friend circles, or dispute larger disputes in Klal Yisrael. The Rambam in the Parish HaMishnai says that Machlok Shama and Hillel, what, what made them special was that there was an absolute search for Emes, and therefore Sofal the Hizkayim, when one is searching for the truth, when one is arguing not because they want to argue, not because they enjoy the fight, they enjoy the battle, but simply because they want to arrive at the Emmas, they want to arrive at the truth, then the words will have an eternal impact. Rabbeinu Yona, in his commentary to Pirkei Avos, says that they will continue to have machlokas with Arichos Yamim, that when one does that, when one is engaged in a machlokas where the focus is Emmas, the, the, what, what kind of brach is that? Sofal is Gayim, that you're going to argue like that forever argue like that forever. Why would you want to argue like that forever? No, it means that you're going to live a long, long time. There will always be ongoing discussions. A relationship should not be like a flat line where nothing happens. There should be excitement. It should be excitement that's handled properly, but there will always, there will always have ongoing discussions. The relationship will not be destroyed. There will be, there will be lively debates at your Shabbos table. It will be something that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that, that, that's a critical part of, of how you run your house and how you run your relationship relationships. The Tosas Yom Tov, he writes that we're not contrasting Shammai and Hillel with Korach Vadaso. That doesn't even make sense, says the Tosas Yom Tov. You're going to contrast Shammai and Hillel versus Korach Vadaso. They wouldn't belong in the same sentence, meaning uh, there's, there's a big gap between Shammai and Hillel on one side and Machlokas Korach Vadaso. And besides that, Shammai and Hillel, Shammai and Hillel were two of the Tanaim, and are Machlokas throughout all the Shas. Why Dafka Shammai and Hillel? Says the Tosas Yom Tov, what we're contrasting is Shammai and Hillel with the base Shammai and the base Hillel. Because the base Shammai and the base Hillel were Talmidim Shlo Shimshu called Tzarchem. They were Talmidim that didn't learn as much as they should have, as much as, much as they were supposed to, from their rebellion. They didn't get all of the details down in a clear way, and that lended itself to Machlokas. If a person is thorough, a person is detail-oriented, and here it is, a person gets all of the facts, then there will be much less to argue about. So much of Machlokas comes when people know part of a story and they immediately formulate an opinion based on part of a story. Lo Shimshu called Sarchan is what brought about the Machlokas of the Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel, and Chazal do not highlight the Machlokas Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel as the ideal in Machlokas. There was something already lacking by the Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel because they didn't have it all. They were not Meshamish called Sarchan. They didn't do as much as they should to get what, to gain whatever they could from their from their rebellion. Shammai and Hillel, they were working with all the facts, and then the Machlokas that emerges is a machlokas that is totally the shame shemayim. Now, an amazing thing about the machlokas shemayim hilo is that there is a clear right and wrong, meaning there is a there is a conclusion in that machlokas. Beshamay b'makom beshilo ain a mishnah. We we cannot pass like the beshamay against the beshilo. We, we, we will, uh, but so so what's what, why is that a wonderful machlokas? I would think that there's one side that's wonderful and the other side is not. No, but we, if one is if one loses a machlokas, at least they helped clarify the. Us. The Mishnah Masech Seduyo says that we specifically record the rejected opinion in Machlokas so that we can clarify that the issues have been raised and dealt with. And future generations can know that if I think of an idea and I see, 
oh, this was dealt with in a previous generation, knowing that things have already been handled, knowing that ideas have already been discussed, is extremely helpful in, in, in furthering Torah education and furthering the Masoras HaTorah. The losing side, therefore, remains part of the process of Talmud Torah. Mar- Rabbi Shechter always points out that what does it mean that Elu Elu Divre Elu Kim Chaim? So one of the things, it means a lot of things, not for now, but one of the things that it means is that even when you study the Shita of the Beis Shammai, you're still studying Torah. You get full credit for Talmud Torah. That even when studying the opinion that's rejected, that too is Talmud Torah. A key mitzvah of Talmud Torah and Shitas Beis Shammai. Because the Shitas Beis Shammai played a critical role in the formulation of the Halacha. The, the Gemara tells us that Even the Sichas Chulun, the regular everyday conversations of Talmud Chachamim need to be studied, need to be learned. So what, what does that mean, Sichas Chulun? Rav Shechter, Marv Rabbi Rav Shechter pointed out to us when we were learning Masech HaSukkah in his shir 20-something years ago, I once reminded him of this. He said, we learned Masech HaSukkah in my shir? Yes, we, uh, we had one full year where we learned Masech HaSukkah beginning to end. We learned the entirety of Masech HaSukkah in his shir. Maybe not the very end, but we learned it was an unbelievable year of learning. And I remember we got to that, uh, that, that, that line in the Gemara, that, that its leaves shall not wither. And the Gemara Darshan says that, that even the everyday talk of Talmud HaChachamim requires limud. And Rav Shechter told us that Rav Chaim Velazhner has a comment where he says, I don't understand what that means, what the words mean. Sichas chulen shal tamidei chachamim. Tamidei chachamim don't talk sichas chulen. Tamidei chachamim aren't talking about uh, the Yankees and the Mets or whatever. Tamidei chachamim are talking about important things. There's no such thing as sichas chulen of tamidei chachamim. So Rav Chaim Velazhner says, oh no, you know what sichas chulen shal tamidei chachamim means? It means when tamidei chachamim try to develop an idea, and inevitably, when you develop an idea, you, you come across ideas that you have to reject, meaning you, you, you have an idea, you have a mahalich in the sugya, and then you see, oh no, that mahalich doesn't work, it doesn't fit with every element of the sugya, and you then reject it, and then you fine tune it a little further. This is the way life goes, right? The person only achieves success when he's achieved failure first, many, many, many times, right? That's what I was just reading the biography of Rav Noach Weinberg, Levracha, the founding Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Seisha Torah, and everyone knows Rav Noach Weinberg was the founding Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Seisha Torah. Can you name the two other yeshivas he founded before that that failed, flopped? They were terrible failures, didn't work. I mean, not terrible failures. I mean, he had some told me to my guess from them, but it didn't work. It didn't last. Rav Noach Weinberg used to say, failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is the prerequisite of success. And that's a very, very important idea, that failure is the prerequisite of success. And the same is true in learning. A person suggests an idea, they have an idea, and then they realize, no, that's not going to work. But that, that thought process helped to, to develop the idea that will work. And that's, that's what says Ruchayim Velashon, what it means, Sichas Chulin Shal Tamidei Chachamim is Tzrich and Limud. That even when, you know, there's Rav Shachta told us, I think, uh, that when Rav Salvechik would come into Shir sometimes, he would spend hours and hours developing a Mahalich. And once in a while, he'd come in the very next day and he would say, everything I said yesterday, forget, it was all wrong. And he would start again and start building the sugya up again as if it was the first time he ever learned that sugya, which is absurd. Of course, it wasn't the first time he had ever learned that sugya, but he approached it with, with fresh eyes each and every time. Everything I said yesterday, so what? You're telling me the three hours I sat in Shir yesterday was all Bittal Torah? That's so depressing. I don't want to hear that. No, it wasn't Bittal Torah. You have a rejected opinion in the Machlach that too is Talmud Torah. It's Trich and Limun. It's Talmud Torah because it helps formulate the opinion that we accept. Now, what are the characteristics of a machlokas, korach va'adasov, the machlokas that we try to avoid? Rabbeinu Yonah writes, korach va'adasov is not sofa le'eskayim, because b'machlokas harishom yasfu yitavu v'sham yamusu k'machlokas shal korach. That a person engages in machlokas shalol l'shem shamayim, they will not be zocha to have future machlokas. They'll die on the spot. Machlokas will kill them. A person is involved in Machlokas Shalom Hashem Shemayim, it has this corrosive effect on the person. A person will never be the same from Machlokas Shalom Hashem Shemayim. 
powerful words of Rabbi Yoni. He says, Sofa Liskai means that you're going to live Arichus Yamin. You engage in Machloka the Shem Shemaim, and you'll have Arichus Yamin. Shalol the Shem Shemaim, the opposite, the opposite, and Shom Yamusu, Ke Machloka Shal Korach. And that's exactly what Korach never got to have, the second Machlokas. He got that one Machlokas, but that was it. Then it was over. And that's 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 a, at an extreme. But any Machlokas, Shalol the Shem Shemaim, maybe not to the extent of Korach, maybe not taking on Moshe Rabbeinu and claiming that the most humble of all leaders in Jewish history is in it for his own self-aggrandizement and honor, maybe not to that extent, but any machlokas that has a shem, it's of shalom shem shemaim, makes us die a little bit inside. It causes us to lose something, some of our innocence, some of our honesty, some of our integrity. And that's what it means, ein sofa lehiskayim. The person, it's not about the machlokas, the person is not sofa lehiskayim, says Rabbeinu Yonah. The Bartanura, the Bartanura says differently. He says, no, what does the word sof mean? Sof means the tachlis, the point, the goal. Whatever the goal of machlokas is, ain't sofa l'iskayim, that goal will not be met when the machlokas is shalom l'shem shemayim. When it's l'shem shemayim and the goal is MS, that goal will be met. If you're a reasonable person uh, approaching a machlokas, l'shem shemayim. And the Tferis Yisrael says, that no, you know what we can see from the machlokas korach v'adasa, and this is pointed out by many of the Mufarshim and Chumash, is that sometimes the worst machlokas shalom l'shem shemayim dresses itself up as a machlokas l'shem shemayim. It dresses itself up as a noble machlokas. Kolaam, kulam kadoshim, everybody's holy, everyone should have a, I'm fighting for the people. I'm not doing this for myself. No, I wouldn't get involved in machlokas for myself. I'm doing it for everybody else. I'm doing it for all of the other people. That's why it's a noble machlokas. But in fact, we know what Korach was really up to. Korach was not interested in other people. He was not interested in helping. He dressed it up. He made it look like it was a machlokas l'shem shemayim. So how can you tell? You know, there are so many, there are so many things that come up. How can you tell if someone is in, in the good fight, a machlokas l'shem shemayim, or if the machlokas that you're about to enter is machlokas shelo l'shem shemayim, is the wrong kind of machlokas? So I would suggest five guideposts to be able to tell whether a machlokas is l'shem shemayim or not. The Bartanura talks about sofa l'hiskayim. He says, you know what sofa l'hiskayim means? How will this machlokas look in 10 years from now? You know, the amazing thing about the machlokas Shammai and Hillel is the staying power of the machlokas Shammai and Hillel. There were Talmidei Be Shammai, there were Talmidei Shammai and Hillel, there was a base Shammai and a base Hillel. Where are the Talmidei Korach Vadasa? How come we don't have a base Korach that's still arguing with the base Moshe? It doesn't happen. There is no base Korach because the machlokas Shalol Shem Shammai doesn't resonate with the next generation. If you see that it resonates, and that's something that people are interested in, that people think this is worth dedicating my life to, this is a cause that's worth it. You see, you think about where is this going to be in 10 years? And that's that's often an indication of machlok l'shem shemayim. Unfortunately, we're not nevi'im, and we don't always know what's going to be important. You know, and uh, there, I'm sure there were people when Rav Salvechik was fighting to keep machitzas in Orthodox synagogues in the 1950s and telling people, skip davening on Rosh Hashanah in, in a shul if the only option doesn't have a machitza. You know, I'm sure there were people that said, why does he have to get involved in the machlokas? Why does he have to bother himself with the machlokas? And, and you look back, and of course, of course, that was such a noble machlokas. Look at the state of orthodoxy in America today, of, of Shmir's Torah and mitzvos, uh, of the community of Shomri Torah and mitzvos. It turns out it was a machlokas that was worth having. It was it was, it was a, 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 a controversy worth entering to, to save the character of a community of, Sh- of Shomri Torah mitzvahs, but we're not all Nevi'im. We don't always know how it's going to end out, but at least, at least retrospectively, at least retrospectively, we should be able to look back and say, has this been worth it? Is it worth digging my heels in even further to continue an old fight that doesn't seem to really matter anymore? There are so many arguments that Talmidim have about Hashkafa, and, and some of these issues about Hashkafa were hot button issues 50 years ago. And now they, they really just don't matter. The world has changed. They're, the issues have changed. And people are, are still having the same old arguments. And one has to reassess. Is it still, does it still matter? Will it still matter? That's guidepost number one. Guidepost number two is an easy one. 
a machlokas in learning is usually of a good machlokas. Esvehiv besufa, the Gemara tells us that if a person afilu avu bino ravu talmido that are engaged in uh, in in in, in machlokas that are engaged in healthy debate, they're only going to come out loving each other more from the machlokas. That's of course provided that the people who are learning together are interested in arriving at the MS. That's that's the goal of learning bechavrusa. The goal, the, the reason learning bechavrusa is so exhilarating is because you can arrive at a truth that you probably would not have been able to arrive at on, on your own. You see a perspective that you cannot see on your own. A person is limited to just one, one point of view, no matter how brilliant he is. Rav Belsky Zechronel of Rachel used to talk about why he thought that OU Kashros was superior to so many other Kashros organizations run by great, great Talmidei Chacham. He said, because you could have a great, great Talmud Chacham, but if he's the only opinion in the room and there's no one there to question him, he's going to miss things. There are things that he's not going to think of. When you have a group of people, when Rebelsky felt that he couldn't say anything without 30 other rabbis questioning everything that he said, that's, that's a way that a person arrives at the MS. When a person is engaged in that process of learning together with someone else and arguing it out, you're only going to come to a greater love of the people that you're engaged with. A third guidepost. Does one side ever admit that they're wrong? If one side never ever admits that they're wrong in ongoing machlokas, and you have no expectation that either side will ever admit that they're wrong, probably it's not the Shem Shemayim. There's an entire chapter of Masech Yaseiduyos that tells us Chazru Beisilu Lahoros Kedivrei Beishamay. Of all the times that they, that initially Beisilu and Beishamay disagreed, and then ultimately the truth came out, and Beisilu said, "You know what? We were wrong." Chazru Beisilu. You know how much integrity that that you know you know what that gives to be, the, the kind of credence that gives to every case where Beisilu did not admit that they were wrong. If you have a person that never, ever admits that they were wrong, you can never know if they're right. But if you have a person who's willing to admit a mistake, who's eager to find the truth, who's eager to admit when they've done something wrong and, is, and, and does not hesitate to do so, well, now every time they haven't admitted that they're wrong, that means something. The same is true with any Mida. You have a person who never, ever gets angry, who never enters the fray of machlokas even. And then one time they do, it makes you think, oh boy, this must be, this must be really worth it. I have a, a, a friend who is a tremendous rabbinic leader. I've never seen him involved in any machlokas. He loves everybody, respects everybody. That's all he, all he could talk is good about everybody. And recently, recently he, he mentioned to me that, that, that I cannot, I cannot deal with this particular Indian, with this particular movement, whatever it was, I'm not going to get into details of Tishba, but with this particular thing. And you know what that meant to me? To hear those words coming out of the mouth of a person who I'd never seen involved in a Locus. If a person is chazu beisila lahoros k'divrei beishamai, then in the places where they do not go back and admit, you know that it must be valuable. A fourth guidepost: the Tosfos Yom Tov writes that a machlokas korach v'adaso doesn't even mention the other side, because the, the 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 one side of the argument is composed of competing agendas within their own camp. Korach had one agenda. Adaso, those who followed him, had a different agenda. It doesn't even mention Korach Adaso against Moshe Rabbeinu. It only mentions Korach the Adaso. That very often, when there's a machloka shalol Hashem Shemayim, one side will have competing agendas within them within themselves. And if there are competing agendas within a single side of the machlokas, that often is an indication of machloka shalol Hashem Shemayim. And a fifth, a fifth guidepost: Is it your machlokas, or is it somebody else's machlokas? If it's not your machlokas, then you probably don't belong. Meaning are, there are some people that love it. They love the controversy. They're attracted like flies to garbage. They just, if there's something going on, they need to be involved. There's a machlokas in the community. They live somewhere else. It doesn't matter. I need to know that. I need to be in the, the thick of it. I need to know what's going on. If it is not your machlokas, then most likely you're not the Shem Shemayim. Reb Chaim Brisker used to give a mashal. Reb Chaim Salvechik used to give a mashal. There's a mouse in someone's house and they need to chase the mouse out of, the, out of their, their home. So what do they do? They take a broomstick and they start chasing after it. And, and guess what? The person who has the mouse in his home also has a pet cat 
in his home. And the cat's chasing the mouse also. Says Rebchaim Brisker, they're both running after the mouse. The balabas with the broom to chase the mouse away. And the cat chasing the mouse. They're both chasing after the mouse. But you know, there's a big difference between them. Because the balabas would be much more happy if the mouse never arrived in the first place. If he didn't have to deal with the mouse. The cat Oh, he's excited. Ah, I had, look, there's a mouse over here. He's so happy about the arrival of the mouse. They look like they're doing the same thing. They're all involved in the same chase. But one person is doing it because it has to be dealt with. And the other party is doing it because they're so excited to be involved in this kind of thing. If it's not your machlokas, chances are you're the cat chasing the mouse. You're not the balabas chasing the mouse who's trying to get rid of it. So there are certain rules of the game. Many of the same rules that apply to Lashon Hara apply to how to engage in machlokas. First of all, no exaggerating. As Chavz Chaim writes in Hilfus Lashon Hara, you can't exaggerate. You can't overstate things. You should handle things in a calm way, not get uh, not get overly uh, uh, emotional, and, and and deal with facts as they are. When you over exaggerate the other side and and how far they've gone and how far they you know you're 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 taking away your own credibility, and you're also setting up a false machlokas. You know, it's very easy to argue if someone uh, believes in something and you say that they don't just believe in that, they believe in that times 10. So it's very easy to argue, you know, with, with, a, you're, with the straw man. It's very easy to argue with an opinion that nobody really holds, but you set up in your own mind. No exaggerating. Second, no self-promotion. It's not about you. It's about the MS. It's always about the MS. And you know what? If there's a way to resolve it that doesn't involve you, great. That's even better. Don't be involved. Don't just try to promote your own agenda. Third, you don't always have to say everything that you know. Yeah, we work with facts. Not every fact always need to be, needs to be stated. And we know this from, uh, from Shalom Bayes, from any, any relationship. A person does not always have to say everything that is true. You know, sometimes you have people that are um, political commentators, let's say, who are, uh, you know, agitators. They're agitators. As long as they, but everything they said is true. Yeah, but not everything that's true should be said. Not every time you have something that's true does it need to be aired out. Does it need to be said publicly? There are words that can never be taken back. And if they're true, they hurt even more. If they're true, it's even worse sometimes. If it wasn't true, okay, uh, you know, the Sheker has no key. But if it's true, you're never going to be able to take that back. Uh, a fourth rule of the game, don't attack people. Attack actions or ideas if they need to be attacked. But never attack people. You know, w- instead of, you're so inconsiderate. Maybe, maybe a phrase like, what you did was really hurtful to me, is much, much more useful than you are so inconsiderate, than defining the person. Defining the person as someone who's an inconsiderate person or as someone who's a mean person. One of Pam's grandson told me that he was once walking with Rapam in a shopping center and there was a mo- young mother reprimanding her child. And she said to the child, you're a bad boy. And Rapam's grandson said he saw Rapam, he had like tears coming down his face. He said, everything okay? Everything okay? He said, I just don't know. How can, how can she say that? How can she tell a child that he's a bad boy? She's defining him as a bad boy? He did something wrong. But he's not a bad boy. So every time someone disagrees with us, you know, there's a word that uh, that sometimes people use for everyone who disagrees with them on, on a shkafic point, to the right or to the left, even just one little bit. It's a, you know what the word is? Apikoros. Everyone's an apikoros. The whole, if anyone disagrees with me by, by even just a little bit, that's enough? That's an apikoros. Not everybody's an apikoros. Sometimes people just have a difference of opinion. And sometimes their opinion is even wrong. You know what? Not even everything that's wrong is apicorsis. You know how many things are apicorsis? 13. The Rambam listed 13. 13 things are apicorsis. There's a whole lot of things that are wrong, that are incorrect. Not everything that's incorrect is apicorsis. So how have Poskim dealt with machlokas? You know, it's amazing. You could see it in, 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 in throughout history, how, how it develops. You have a Neid Behuda, Neid Behuda has a comment in, in uh, Madura Kami, Yerodeya Simen Aleph, the very first shuv in Yerodeya. Whatever the issue was that he was asked about, he writes, Vina sheyishma ma'alosu la'atsasi, please listen to my advice. V'yitein makom l'shalom, 
always make room for peace. The ein lecha garua mei a machlokas. A lot of times people get involved in machlokas and they burn bridges. They make it so that there's no there's no there's no path back to peace. Says no debuda yitain makom l'shalom. Always leave room for peace to happen. There is nothing that is more debilitating than machlokas. Ubizmanenu he says, and I just note that nowadays lo shchiach machlokas l'shem shemayim. You cannot find too many machlokas l'shem shemayim. It's uncommon. Vasatan merakid. The satan is dancing. He's enjoying this. He's the cat running around the house. He's thrilled for the mouse to be there. And the Nodibuta says, I beg you, just make shalom. And when Knesset Yisrael comes together and we make shalom and we leave room for shalom, not by avoiding machlokas, but by handling machlokas properly, by handling our disagreements properly, by knowing how to have a dispute. You know, in, 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 in the Why You Smicha program, I just discovered this year, I didn't know that this even existed in the program. There is a very, I'm not going to get into it right now because I don't want to get sidetracked, but there is a very hot button issue that is debated among Rabbanim within our community. And we, we bring in, I don't do it, Rabbi Rothbach is responsible for it, brings in two Rabbanim, very well respected Rabbanim in our community, to have the debate in front of the Talmudim. To have the debate. This is the kind of debate that Talmudim will call each other up, because of about one way or the other. But when you see two Gedolei Rabbanim in our community have the debate and have it successfully and have it respectfully, it shows Machlokas isn't bad. Machlokas, when done right, is great, but it has to be done right. And, and that's the message, I think, to take away from Tish above. The opposite of Sin Aschinam is not that there not be machlokas. It's our religion relies on machlokas. We need it. We cannot have the anvasnu social Rabbi Zachariah ben Avkulos. But we have to learn how to speak respectfully, how to make sure that our, our motivations are proper. And through that, we'll have machlokas that will bring us to a greater level of Venice. And when it does that, when we get to a higher level of Venice, that's ultimately a closer relationship with the Rebona Shalom. And that is what brings about Hashra's Hashkina should happen in the Karabi Amen.